But uh, welcome to our webinar today. Uh, the webinar is about preventing falls and improving balance. Um, I'm Marisha. I'm a physical therapist here at Greenwich Hospital. Um, I coordinate the office for our 260 Long Ridge Road in Stamford. We have Sue Cavanaugh today uh, with us. And uh, we have a presentation. She's a physical therapist who has uber years of experience in fall prevention and vestibular therapy. Um, she's the one actually who got me into this, so I owe her big time. Um, but welcome. And if you have any questions, you guys can ask, type it in the Q&A section. And uh, Sue or I, either us, one of us will try and answer them. We do try to leave the Q&A um, section towards, more towards the end of this webinar so that we can all answer the questions. Um, but here we go. We start. Give me one second. Okay, I will be speaking closer to the mic. Let me know if you can hear me now. Um, okay, so I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, so preventing falls and improving balance, an important topic in our day-to-day -day life. Um, First of all, accepting and admitting that our body is changing is our biggest barrier. I have had so many patients who come to me and they talk about not being balanced, but they would refuse to use any of the assistive devices like a cane. But if you ask me as a physical therapist, my biggest perspective was, would be quality of life is very important and so is independence. So if the cane and give you your independence and prevent a fall or any major injuries, I think it's worth accepting that your body is changing and we need to do that. And everybody's body is changing. My balance is not the same as it was when I was 20. Um, so you have to accept that. But once you accept that and adapt to a healthier lifestyle, make safer choices, I think you can preserve your independence and move on and live a safe healthy life for a longer period of time be more functional some common facts falling is very common most of the falls occur in the house during your day-to-day -day activities somebody's in the kitchen in the bathroom trying to run to go grab a phone call stuff like that most falls result in a scrape or a bruise but often they cause a fracture of a wrist or a shoulder or a hip and that's what we're really wanting to avoid as we get older our bones also don't heal that fast unless like like when you are 10 but so we want to prevent it as much as possible many believe that it's not going to happen i have this argument with most of my patients every day that i won't fall or the biggest argument i get is i know how to fall and it just takes one time is what I would say. It takes one bad fall for something really bad to happen. So preventing it is the best way to go. The American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons has declared an epidemic for hip fractures from falls in USA. Geriatricians know that there are two major reasons for people to end up in a nursing home. One's Alzheimer's, we're working on it. And the other is falls. Research shows that we can reduce the chance of falling by 30%. And that is a big number. Patients are at a higher risk of fall after hospitalization. Uh, 10 days of bed rest can result in a bone loss that take up, takes up to four months to replace. And the strength diminishes by 5% each day. I mean, forget hospitalization. That is one of the major events. But even if you have a flu and you're in bed for five days, you wake up and it takes you about two weeks to become your normal self. You cannot just get over a flu and then go run on a treadmill. It's not going to happen. Our body takes time to recoup. And then on top of it, you add hospitalizations where you're in a bed where you're not moving around that much. It is just that much worse. According to, US, according to the U.S. Center of Disease Control and Prevention, one in four American aged 50, 65 and above fall each year. That's a big number. It was one in seven when we started doing this presentation about a few years ago. And over just a period of few years, it has changed to one in four. 
Every 11 seconds, an older adult is treated in the emergency room for a fall, and every 19 minutes, an adult dies from a fall. These are recent stats, and they're pretty concerning. Um, falls are the leading cause of fatal injury and the most common cause of non-fatal trauma related to hospital admissions, mostly hip fractures, shoulder fractures, wrist fractures, or a head injury. Falls result in more than 2.8 million injuries treated in the emergency departments annually, including over 800,000 hospitalizations and more than 27,000 deaths. These numbers, as I said, are concerning. So whatever we can do to prevent a fall and prevent hospitalization from a fall and prevent any major injury from a fall, we should do. In 2015, the total cost of fall injuries was $50 billion, and not million, billion dollars. Medicare and Medicaid shouldered about 75% of this cost. So you see that besides, it not just affects us directly, but it also has a pretty significant indirect effect on our life. The financial toll for older adult falls is expected to increase as the population ages and may reach 67.7 billion by 2020, which is already 2020 because this was in 2015. 30 million older adults fall each year, resulting in about 30,000 deaths. Each year, 3 million older adults are treated for fall injuries. One out of every five falls cause a serious injury, such as broken bones or head injury. Each year, at least 300,000 older people are hospitalized for hip fractures. More than 95% of hip fracture are caused by falling, usually sideways, but 95%, that's a big number. So now imagine if we can prevent falls, it might really help not to break a bone. Women fall more often than men and account for three quarters of all hip fractures. Women are also more prominent or more, uh, so more they, are, they tend to get osteoporosis more than men, and that might be also one of the reasons that they break their hip easier after a fall. So this diagram shows how the deaths, the fall deaths are increasing by every hour. And it, it just, it's concerning to us as physical therapists. Consequences of a fall, what could happen after a fall? Fear or loss of confidence. You know, once somebody falls, you, people don't have the confidence. They tend to kind of hang on to furniture when they walk around their homes. They don't feel like they want to go out because they don't feel safe. They don't feel like they want to go out for a walk because they don't feel safe. Decline in function. Obviously, the less you move, the less and less and less activity your body able, is able to do, which also decreases your overall function, your cardiac health, your overall general health, everything. Injury, obviously fall causes an injury. You, can, you may go, about, go away with the getaway with the sprain rather than a broken bone, but a sprain takes as much time to heal as much as a fracture. Nursing home placement. When you fall and you can't walk, you are not independent. And if you're living alone or even living with just one person, uh, it is hard and you might be placed in a nursing home. And as of now, especially during the COVID times, it's a very hard situation to be in. The worst that can happen with a fall, death. I've, I've seen a few head injuries and um, it's, it's very concerning. And it just does not affect you. It affects everybody. You being in the nursing home, your family is affected when you're not moving and you're not independent. They have to take care of you. You're dependent on someone, the financial strain. So a fall can affect an entire family, not just the person who has fallen down. We're gonna discuss a few risk factors that increase your chances of fall. And Sue and I like to like to show our little tower thingy. Each risk factor is a tower, is a block at the top of the tower. The less blocks you can have, the better. As you see, if I add on to the blocks, it's gonna, hard, it's gonna be hard to balance for me right now, and then it may cause a fall. So we really need to try and decrease as many risk factors as possible. So. 
as we said, it's a tower of blocks. The more I think we went through this. Okay. First risk factor, home. We went through this saying most falls happen in the house, in your backyard, in the bathroom, in the kitchen, in your living room. It's in the house. We tend to multitask and we are able to do that when we are younger. As we get older, we, our reflexes decrease. Our multitasking abilities, our brain's ability to focus on five different things at once decreases. Even, if it, even with familiar surroundings, even in the house where you know everything is, multitasking gets a little difficult. So one of the easiest thing to do is focus on one thing at a time. The other, like if you're in the kitchen and somebody calls and there's a phone call, you don't have to leave everything and run for your dear life to get up that, to get pick up that phone. You can take it easy. Somebody, if they need you, they'll call again. And if they need you, they will leave a message. We have all these technologies now. So you need to take, make use of them. Keep our walking paths clear. I can tell you how many older people's homes, including my grandmother's house, I have been to. She has about five rugs in her living room, all different styles from all over the world. I don't know why, but she does. It's a big fall risk. As you tend to shuffle and you have difficulty lifting your legs up, it's a very high risk to get your leg tucked into one of those rugs and then fall. So it's also very important to keep the walking path's clear to have less clutter in the house either. So you have to have clear walking pathways. Use nightlight. As we all know, if we're standing up and we're balancing ourselves, if you close your eyes, it is a little hard to balance because we do use our vision as one of the important aspects of balancing. At night, when you wake up in the middle of the night, there are a couple of things. You need to go to the bathroom. You are not fully awake. You are a little groggy. Your brain is not clear. It's foggy. And then on top of it, you cannot see. We also will go through something which is a little bit of partial hypotension. I'm sure you all will be uh, feeling that, that when you get out of bed quickly or if you get out of a chair quickly, you feel a little dizzy. So you need to give yourself a little time. Now in the middle of the night, you have all these factors going on to you and now you have no light to walk to the bathroom to. Having just a little bit of a nightlight, and now we have these beautiful LED lights, you plug it in, they turn on when it's dark and they turn off when it's light. You gotta use that so that you can have a little light and you can see where you're going. There are three areas where people most likely get hurt. Stairs, you have to concentrate on each stair. Most probably when you're stepping up, you do not tend to lift your leg up high enough and you trip on that step and you stub your toe maybe several times. That is very important. I have seen people carrying and walking with a plate and a bucket of water and some laundry, everything together, five things at once, plus talking on the phone. Do not do that. Have at least one of your hands empty to hold. Don't mean that you have to lean on to the rail, but at least one hand should be empty to hold on or touch a rail to make it safe, especially while going down. Count the steps till you reach the top or the bottom so that your brain knows how many steps are in there. If you're carrying something heavy, especially like a laundry bucket, I wouldn't carry it in a bucket, I'd put it in a bag, a laundry bag, throw it down the stairs and then go downstairs rather than holding and having both of my hands occupied. Clothes don't break, so it is fine. You can throw your clothes down. Um, it's very important. These are the small changes that we don't really think about when we are 20s and we have been doing this for a long time. But if you make these minor changes, you might not have to make a major change in your functional ability later. Climbing and displacing activities. When your posture or position changes, your center of gravity changes. Ask for help. Do not try to change that light bulb all by yourself. Or I have an 85 year old neighbor who still somehow is always on his roof and it is really scary. Um, eliminate the ladders, footstools, chairs, 
do not climb on anything that has wheels at all or anything that has low center of gravity so that you can slip and fall. Think about your posture. Make the necessary changes. The pot and pan that you use every day does not need to be on the top of the shelf where you need a step stool. Keep it down. Keep it where it's reachable. You might need to rearrange a few things, and that's okay. So think about all the small changes. Other things you need to be careful about. A screen door or a door that is a little tight or a little drawer that is sticking out, an overhead shelf or under counter. All these things, while you're working around it, can lead to a fall. These things tend to make you lose your balance, or at least you're struggling to keep that balance. And it just, it, it, it's one more thing to the added tower. These are the small things that we can change. There are so many things that you cannot change, but these things you can change and you can decrease the size of that tower. Footwear. All right, this is my favorite. Shoes which are too tight or too high. The heels, not mine, they're Sue Cavanaugh's. I do not wear heels because I cannot walk in them. Um, so that's something which can lead to an ankle sprain. You tort or not twist your ankle and you fall. Back shoes, these are my favorites. The ones that slip on. These are very comfy, especially in the winter time. But if you notice and think about it, you will see that any shoe that does not have a support in the back, in the heel or the back part of your ankle, you tend to shuffle because if you lift your legs up or lift your foot off the ground, the shoe falls off. So your brain's like, do not lift the foot off the ground. So now you're just shuffling. You're not picking up your feet. So that becomes a tripping hazard. Um, so that's something like that, which is important. Socks. We all have hardwood floors now. And if you wear socks that are slippery, you might just slip and fall. Be careful about it. My, nowadays, there are socks with grips, which I think you can see in the bottom left of my presentation. Um, they have nice grips underneath it so that you can wear those socks that, that give you a little support on the foot. Do not wear socks on hardwood floors. It is a very bad thing. Sensory. This is the third part of the tower. Anything that puts you out of touch with your environment increases your chances of fall. Neuropathy. You have numb feet. You have diabetes. You cannot feel. You know how I've seen patients tell me, I feel like I'm walking on cloud. I don't feel the bottom of the floor. I also have patients tell me, I don't feel whether my foot is on the accelerator or the brake. You got to have to think about this. It has to be, that, that's a safety hazard. So be careful with that. Get your vision checked once a year. As I said, vision is a very, very important part of our balance system. We balance through a few of our systems, vision, ears, uh, joint receptors, but vision plays a very important part. You have to be able to see clearly. I have also seen people's glasses. They are so dirty. I have no idea how do you see through them. So make sure your glasses are clean. Um, do not walk with your reading glasses because your reading glasses magnifies everything. So it gives you a wrong sense of depth and you cannot judge the depth perception. And that may cause a fall. Keep glasses clean. Keep, fix your cataracts ASAP. Especially nowadays, the cataract surgeries, one, they're easy. Two, I think they give you better vision than any 20-year-old can have because of the lenses they put in. It's like a 2040 vision, not even a 2020 vision. So it's a, it's a good thing. If you have cataracts, get them done when your doctor tells you to. If you have hearing problems, wear your hearing aids. Get the wax in your ears clean. Talk to your doctors about it because we also balance a lot through our sensory auditory systems. If you wake up confused in the bed, do not get out of bed. I would recommend everybody when you get out of bed in the morning, give yourself about 10 seconds and sit at the edge of the bed. Even if you think you're okay, even if you think you're not confused, even if you think you're not dizzy. Just give yourself a little time and then get up. Stay seated until your head clears out or until you get help. 
falls in hospitals and unfamiliar environments are very common. It's because when you're in a hospital, sometimes people are dehydrated. Sometimes they wake up and they think they're in their home, but they're not in their home. They're in a different or place. You can be on your, in, on your daughter's or son's home, and now you're not in the same room you wake up in. And it just, it, it little mind boggles you, and now you're confused. So give yourself 10 seconds. It will really, really help prevent any other falls. As I said, we, have, we, we use a lot of our sensory inputs to prevent falls and maintain balance. And if we don't have all of our sensory inputs working, just a bigger chances of a fall. Polypharmacy. Falls risks increases if a person takes four or more drugs each day. And if I if you were all here in front of me, I would ask you to raise your hand to see how many of them there, and most of us are. I have seen people on 20 pills a day, or 30 pills a day, or 10 pills a day. Um, but the fall risk increases because all these drugs tend to interact with each other, and most of the drugs, not all, most of the drugs, their main side effects, if you look, is dizziness. So you have to be careful. Carry an up-to-date medication list, I would always carry it with me because otherwise every doctor is going to add on one more medication. And now you're going to end up with five doctors and 15 pills. So always make sure they know what medications you're taking. Get all the medications at one pharmacy. This is a very important one which we don't think about. Pharmacists, they really know how each medication interacts with the other medications. So if you have one pharmacist who knows you your medications and now you go to see another doctor and they prescribe something, it is very easy for them to pick up the phone and call the doctor and be like, hey doc, I know you prescribed this medication, but he's, he or she is already taking this other pill and I don't think it's a good idea and they can manage your medications pretty well. So try to get all your medications at one pharmacy. Check with your pharmacist. There's no harm in asking the pharmacist how or how okay it is or how safe it is to add in a new prescription or even an over-the-counter medication because over-the-counter does not mean it is absolutely safe. When offered a new prescription, ask what else can I do to take, to do, to not take this medication. There are some times you definitely need medications. There are some cases you have high blood pressure, you have diabetes, you need what you need but try not to take anything extra. Besides polypharmacy, also do not just stop taking your medications because I have seen people decide whether they wanna take their medications or not all by themselves. And the doctors think they're taking it, but they're not because they thought that one of the side, some side effects were not, but what was bothering them. And they'll just like, oh, I just decided to stop the pill. Do not do that because that is as harmful as taking an additional pill. So please always contact the doctor if you want to add or subtract any medication. Even if you want to add supplements, I would say please contact your primary care physician to see if those supplements are not going to react with any other medication that you have or if they're safe to take. Talk to your MD. Con contact your pharmacist. They are the best people to help you or guide you in what medications are the best for you. Um, Remember, you need the drugs, but they're increased. But they are, they do increase your risk of falls. So, as I said, you take the drugs you need, but don't take a lot of them. I'm gonna pass um, this presentation now on to Sue Cavanaugh, and uh, she's gonna take over from now onwards. Give me one second. Hold on one second, please. Okay. Yep. Can I advance it? I may just need you. Let's hold on, everybody. Or I'll just have you do it. Hold on, we're just, I'm just going to get control of my screen. But while Marisha's fixing her screen, um, I'm Sue Cavanaugh. 
I just wanted to um, let you know that the information that we're working with here, permission I didn't pull out of our hat. This is a, an effort done by the Connecticut Collaboration for, for Fall Prevention. I don't have it on my screen. Do you have it in your No, no, you have it. Can you just advance it for me? Yeah. All right, we're getting back on track. So this is a presentation that's, it's information pulled together by the Connecticut Collaboration for, for Paul Prevention. Um, it's a team of, it was a team of 3,000, am I on? A team of over 3,000 nurses, doctors, ER staff, um, senior center coordinators. Um, all, all the, this team of 3,000 pulled together all this information for you to better to try and improve your life because of what they were seeing out, out there. Okay, we on? All right, so we're back. Um, so I'm gonna talk about the, the next three risks. Remember, I wanna reiterate, there are seven risk factors that they've developed that increase your risk of falling. You have a choice. Now that the risk factors Marisha talked about, we got our little tower. Ooh. Some of those risk factors you can control. You can control your home hazards. You can control that draw that's stuck, don't use it, or pull up that carpet so you don't trip on it. Those are things you can control. If you decide not to do that, then you're putting an extra risk on your chance of falling. If you decide to wear those heels, you're short and you've always worn heels all your life, understand that that's a risk and that puts you at more risk of falling. That's your choice. Certain things you can't control. You can't control that blood pressure medication that may make you a little dizzy if that's what you need to keep your blood pressure down or some of the other medications that you take. So those, you have to evaluate how many risks you're at that you can't control. You can't control those, that eyesight that's failing you, that's gonna put you at risk. Um, but so there are certain things you can control and certain things you can't control. One of the things you can't control I'm gonna talk about is your postural blood pressure, what we call postural hypotension. That's when your blood pressure drops suddenly when you go to stand up from a sitting or lying down position that can make you very dizzy. And in some cases it can make you pass out. So also understand you can have this effect if you're over medicated or if you're suffering from dehydration. So those are things to keep an eye on. If you think you're over medicated, then it's a time to talk to your doctor about it. Um, I do have a gentleman I'm working with who's struggling with blood pressure issues. So we're working with the doctor to try and regulate that so he doesn't feel so dizzy when he stands up. Um, so that's something to look at and have a conversation with your doctor. So you have this fluid balance in your body and it's, it, that, that, um, it's a very delicate fluid balance and it's, it's affecting the, the, the pressure in the, the leg, your muscles, sorry, your, your leg muscles work like a pump to get the blood back up through your body into your brain. Sometimes that doesn't happen as fast as we want it to. And there's a little slowness when to adapt to positional changes. So you gotta give your body time to adapt. If you're having trouble with, with blood pressure changes and getting up, then maybe you need to move your legs a little bit before you actually stand so you don't get that rush. The, the body needs to start moving that, that blood. Um, the and muscles need to keep working to get that blood up to your brain. An inadequate blood flow to the brain may cause some dizziness. So give yourself time. Um, especially true to remember when you're getting up in the middle of the night. So give yourself that minute, even though, you know, yeah, I got to go to the bathroom, give yourself a couple of minutes, get those legs going, then get up. Never attempt to walk when you're feeling dizzy. Um, and if try and focus on something. If you wake up dizzy, try and focus on something, get your legs moving, get ready to go, and then wait till it clears before you get up. Next slide, Marsh. Okay, so I talked about dehydration. Dehydration can make you feel dizzy. Understand that 70% of our body consists of water. We need to replace that water throughout the day. So drinking a small glass of water, a four ounce glass, or a half a cup, they recommend every, every half hour, or one of these guys, this eight ounce, those little water bottles that you see around all the time, get one of those in you every hour for the first eight hours you're up. Now, does it have to be water? No, you prefer juice, get some liquids in you and get it in you earlier in the day so you don't have to worry about running to the bathroom in the middle of the night as much. Um, better to take it in during the day. Especially important now that well, summer's almost over, maybe. We got a hot spell, it gets really humid out, you need, you need more water. Um, 
I always bring my mother into the picture. She's a prime example. I tell her, listen, if it's hot and the temperature is up at night and you don't want to put on air conditioning because you don't have air conditioning, you refuse to get air conditioning and you're sleeping in 80 degree weather, you're going to wake up dehydrated. Get some water in you first thing in the morning so your body can, your body needs that fluid and your, your, you need that fluid, you need to pump that, that blood through so you don't get dizzy. Um, and I say that if you're on fluid restrictions, that's a different story. This may not necessarily apply to you. You have to be a little bit more careful. But understand, think of uh, the flowers in your, in your flower pot in your garden. If you forget to water them, a couple of dry days outside and you don't water them, they're gonna look pretty limp. And if you don't give them enough water, they're gonna die. You're the same way, you need that water. Take a glass of water when you're feeling tired, a little dizzy, take a glass of water and see if it doesn't make you feel better. All right. Coffee does not count, no. Caffeine, caffeine will dehydrate you. So you cannot count that as a fluid. Um, I, I also talked to my mother about wine, alcohol, or caffeine. You have that extra cup of coffee in the morning, you need that extra glass of water. You have that glass of wine. If we give you a glass of wine with dinner, you're gonna need some more water. Um, so you have to balance it out. Good question, thank you. I did mean to talk about that. Okay, next slide. Okay, so remember what goes in must come out. So we're, we're like, you know, it's like toilet training for the kids. If every adult needs to go to the bathroom every couple of hours, rather than waiting till it's a last minute rush, you know, because um, sometimes it may be a little hard to get to the bathroom, just time yourself and just do it. Every couple of hours, get up and go to the bathroom. Obviously, I don't want you doing it in the middle of the night. Um, but during the day, just don't wait for your body to tell you and then it's too late and you're rushing to the bathroom. Just try and get in there every couple hours. Especially if you're drinking throughout the day, you're gonna need to get in there every couple hours. And this helps the body get rid of the waste products and prevents those drugs from accumulating in your body and just keeps you overall healthy. And, and look, it gets you up and it gets you moving. You're getting some exercise, sit to stand every couple hours, so it's all good. Um, know that in the emergency room, we see a high rate of dehydration, especially over the summer. Because most people, like my mom, you're going to an event, you don't want to drink any water because you don't want to have to go to the bathroom the whole time you're there. Well, if you deprive yourself of water for too long, you're more sensitive. As we get older, we're more sensitive to those changes, especially if you're in a hot auditorium, which hopefully nobody's in a hot crowded auditorium anymore. Um, but you know, come keep this tucked in the back of your mind for the future. We're not gonna be socially distancing forever, hopefully. Um, and look at your urine. If you go to the bathroom and your urine is dark, you are not drinking enough water. It should be pale, nice pale yellow, not a dark yellow, a pale yellow. Next slide. Okay, so the next two slides, this is where your PTs come in, your risk factor. So I. Blood pressure changes, you can't control, but you can control how much you drink when you go to the bathroom. Um, the next two risk factors, probably things you can't necessarily control, but you can to some, to some degree. So difficulty walking, getting up or sitting down and losing your balance, it's a mouthful. So understand your posture, your balance, your strength, your flexibility, they all play a role in good, safe, efficient movement. And we're gonna break it down. Your posture we, is how you carry your body, how you carry your body weight against the forces of gravity. And that determines your center of gravity. We have little reactions called like a, one, one is a stepping reaction. This is your body's ability to catch itself when you're starting to lose your balance. Or you, you know, somebody pushes you and you step forward, that's a stepping reaction. Next slide. So we require th this, sufficient strength and balanced and adequate flexibility to keep our movements efficient, to perform our daily tasks. But very easily we can decline in these areas little by little and you don't really notice it until all of a sudden you can't do something or you fall. Um, like I said, these changes can happen over time. Everyday activities get more difficult, getting out of the tub, getting in and out of bed. These losses can be regained and maintained by trying to stay as active and integrating some exercise into your life. And that's what we do. We, we teach people exercises. Um, there are wonderful programs out there, um, like a Tai Chi program, but maybe now you have to do it 
by Zoom or on video, or just getting out and walking. 10 to 15 minutes of exercise a day really can make a difference. Next slide. If you don't use it, you lose, use, lose it. You lose it, sorry. <laughs> so if you notice a problem with your balance or your walking, you know, ask your doctor to get a referral for an evaluation with therapy. Um, even people with chronic conditions, you can have subtle changes over time. Maybe you need a little tune-up. Um, so let's talk a little bit about posture. We're going to zone in on posture. So we want to make sure that um, posture will make a big difference in where your center of gravity is. So if you're suffering from some spinal issues, whether it be a scoliosis, what they call a kyphosis, where you're bent over or bent over to one side, understand now that puts you a little off center of gravity. That little off center of gravity is going to change your your ability to weight shift, it's gonna pull you down on one side. That's gonna put you at risk for a fall. Is that something you can change or not change? With a little therapy, can you change it? With exercises, can you change it? Or is it a permanent thing that you have to adapt to? That's what we have to look at. Um, and when we look at posture, this is kind of, I'm not gonna be able to show you, but understand if you're slumped over in your chair, you, you're putting a lot of strain on your spine. We want you to be more upright and straight so that the center of gravity goes through your spine and the weight is equally distributed throughout the spine. You're gonna be more efficient in your movements. You say, well, what difference does it matter how I sit? Well, if you sit like this all the time, your body starts to adapt to the chair you're sitting in, in this position. And before you know it, you're getting up. So if you're sitting straighter and more erect and you got a little cushion behind your back, I always recommend you support your lumbar spine that little curve where your waistline is, put something in there, support that spine, so then when you get up, you're a little straighter. Maybe not perfectly straight, but straighter than all hunched over. I know if you sit like this all the time in the chair, you're gonna end up looking like the chair. Try not to sit more than 30 minutes. Um, get up and move around. And of course, if you're drinking that water, you're gonna have to get up a little bit more often. So there's another benefit. You're not gonna be sitting in your chair too long. Drop sitting, it's that, back down. Don't, we, we advocate not doing that. Um, number one, it's jarring on your spine and hips. You may, and if you're not careful, you may drop and miss the chair and fall off to the side. Um, but it's also a wonderful opportunity that you've missed to do a wonderful exercise, which is strengthening the legs. Just by lowering yourself down slowly, you're working those quad muscles and they need to, they need to be nice and strong. Um, so that's posture. Other thing I want, want to talk to you about as far as posture, understand too, if you're, if you're unfortunately ha have a, a little bit of a curve to your spine, what has that done to how your bathrobe hangs on you? If you're wearing something long, and again, I bring my mom into this because she's got this lovely long dress. You have a curve to your spine. It's hanging a little longer tripping hazard, your bathrobe may be a tripping hazard, your shower robe, if it's hanging a little longer, are you gonna trip on it? Because your spine's changed. It's not the robe, the robe didn't all of a sudden get longer, you got shorter. Um, the difficulty with walking. So again, some of these things you can change, some you can't. If you have an unequal step length. Now, when we talk about that, it's when one leg may be bothering you. So you don't wanna put the weight on it, so you take a quick step off of it. Um, it's an uneven step when you're, when you're walking. So it, you, you tend to um, throw your weight more one way than the other, and that can increase your chance of tripping. Is that something that one of the therapists here can teach you how to better accommodate for? Is it something that can be worked out? Or is it something that you need to live with and accommodate for? Knowing that it's there with a cane or assistive device ease that step length so it's not so much of a problem. Um, another common problem is when you lose your balance if you turn too quickly. I've seen, you know, you're, you're, you're walking straight ahead and somebody calls your name, you turn around to talk to them or you're distracted, you turn quickly and you're, you're pivoting around on that foot. Are your responses to that shift not as good as they used to be? Your reaction time. And if that's so, you can't take that quick pivot. Understand that you need to or to turn your whole body around or take a big step, but you can't pivot. Rushing or pivoting on that foot 
will decrease your base of support. Um, and that usually happens when you're trying to think of something else. Oh, I got to go right back and get something. Oh, the phone's ringing. And I turn around and I twist and down I go. It's that you've lost that ability to regain your balance, that stepping reaction. Is that something you can regain through exercise, perhaps? Um, we tend to think about when you're, when you're a kid, you're running, you're jumping, you're moving in all different directions. As we get older, we get up, we move straight ahead. How many times do we turn to the side or go backwards? So we're gonna talk about that. Um, one of the most common things we see is um, shuffling, shortened step, step length or shuffling. And like Marisha talked about, if you're in shoes, again, my poor mother has these shoes that I keep yelling at her not to use because when she wears them, she shuffles. And when you shuffle, you have the inability to pick your feet up. So if there's a little bit of a, a, a lip in the, in, the, in the floor or something on the floor or, or a stone in your path, it, you're not picking your foot up, you're gonna trip on it. Something's gonna block that shuffle and you're gonna trip on it. Um, you know, is this because your, your posture is forward and you can't pick your foot up in the way that you're used to? Either you have better ability to pick your foot up, mainly because your weight of gravity is forward, so it makes it more difficult to get that leg forward. Or do we need to work on postural changes to get you straighter so you can lift that leg? Um, if you're shuffling, your, your, your balance is declining because you're not able to shift your weight onto one leg. So think about if you shift all your weight onto one leg, then you're able to pick the other leg up to take a, um, take a step up or to go up on a curb. Um, so you need that ability to be able to shift your weight onto one leg and then the other to do steps and curves. If you're shuffling, you're losing that ability because you're, you're not fully putting the weight on one leg to unload the other one. So if it's a physical problem that you have because of a neuromuscular disorder, such as Parkinson's, that's something we need to help you with. But if it's simply habit because you're wearing bad shoes, you're gonna, you know, remember your body adapts to what you tell it to do. If you're doing that all the time, your body's gonna forget how to pick that leg up to get up that step, and then it becomes an issue. Um, was I done? I said, you remember the slide. <laughs> Let's see. Oh, so yes, you guys was. Balance is a skill that can be maintain, maintained or regained. We lose these skills if we don't practice them. Yes, yeah, sorry, Marcia, go ahead. So if you have a device that you're using to help you walk, keep it in good, good shape. You can always um, ask a professional, one of the therapists, to help you with adjustment of height to fit the device to you. Um, but know that balance exercise every day will improve how you walk. It's simple, simple stuff we, you can do to help maintain your balance. Let's go next. So we're gonna skip that for a minute. We can go back if, we're gonna talk about balance exercises. So you can practice, um, balance exercises help you practice different positions you may find yourself in if you start to fall. So we talked about the stepping reactions. We talked about postural stuff. Um, we wanna help you develop quicker reflexes and develop strength. When people say, oh, you know, I don't feel like I'm strong enough. Your body is holding you up. Your postural muscles hold you up all day. Use them and, and maximizing them makes you strong. Let's go to the next slide. So there are some exercises that, that um, the Yale Fall Prevention Committee has come up with. I'm not gonna be able to show you them here on this venue, but I can tell you, and you're probably saying, oh, I'm very disappointed but I can tell you very simply what they are. It's weight shifting. If you stand in front of your kitchen counter, hold onto the counter and just shift your weight from one foot to the other and sway. Turn on the music and just sway. That is balance exercises. And then if you get a little bit braver and you put your weight on one foot, can you lift the other one up and put your weight on one foot and lift? Just holding onto the counter. The principle is we wanna teach you how to shift your weight from one foot to the other. Did you lose that ability? Did you lose that ability because you're shuffling? Did you lose that ability because one leg hurts more? You know, what, what's going on? Or did you just forget how to do it? Um, so that's key. The other thing is I talked about, you know, when we're kids and you're running all over the place, we use movement in all different directions. Your body should be able to move in different directions. 
Can you step to the side carefully? So hold on to that kitchen counter, walk sideways. Hold on to that kitchen counter, walk the other way. Simple. Can you bend the knee? Put it down. Bend down. These are all balance exercises. And when you do it, tighten up those abdominal exercise, um, abdominal muscles. Not just, it's not just the legs. Your core, your stomach determines where your leg is going. So if you tighten your core, you're going to find it easier to move your leg. Let's see what the next slide says. Okay, so we're going to get back. So, you know, if you have questions about exercises, we'll try and answer them. But understand it's, if I want to get through, I want to get through what, what you need to do. Look at your posture. Can you correct it? Tighten up your belly. Can you shift your weight from side to side? Can you lift one leg and then the other? Can you walk sideways on that kitchen counter? Um, those are the main things. So we talk about um, if you fell. If you fell tonight, how would you get up? What would you do? Do you have a plan? Next slide. So we know that 40% of, of older adults who fall and were not injured, um, they, were, they reported they were unable to get up without assistance. So laying on that floor, even though you're not hurt, laying on that floor still can be dangerous because if you can't get up and nobody finds you for a while, you become dehydrated, confused, and we find that you have a poor outcome when you do eventually get to the hospital. So you need a plan. So if how, how would you get up? All right, first off, what I want you to do is look at, okay, if I fall, I want you to take a second and kind of figure out, okay, am I hurt? Did I hurt something? Can I move? Do I need help? If you need help, how are you going to reach them? Are you going to put a, is there a phone nearby that you can get from the floor? Do you have a cell phone on you? Do you have some kind of alert system on your wrist or on your neck? Um, next, if you're concerned about falling, maybe you should think about one of those alert systems. Because many times um, people say, oh yeah, I had my cell phone, but it was in the kitchen. It's not going to help you if it's in the kitchen, if you're in the living room and you're on the floor. Um, not many people have old landlines that you can crawl over to and pull down to get, um, to get help. So, and is there somebody nearby that you can shout for help? Somebody coming to get, somebody checks on you every day that you know is coming. Maybe you can just make yourself comfortable until they get there. I would hate to see you on the floor for too long. Um, so if you're not hurt, how are you going to get up? So check yourself. Am I hurt? Do, can I get myself over? The best thing to do is to try and roll over onto your side, crawl on over. Think about, I think about um, a little baby, toddler. How do they crawl? You've seen them when they first start out. If you have to, crawl on your elbows and push with your feet. And kind of like that little, I think of a little frog, but the frogs do, huh? But you're, you're crawling, you think, think of a little toddler crawling. And then if you can, can you get up on your knees and crawl over to a chair? And then grab the chair, and you don't necessarily have to get up all the way, but grab the chair, and you want a secure chair, and pull yourself up and put your butt on the chair, and then just sit and relax and say, okay, am I okay? And maybe I should call someone to come check me out or sit with me and make sure I'm okay. So if you have bad knees and you can't kneel, can you log roll yourself? Remember the old log roll, you know, fire drill, when I remember when I was a kid, get down and you roll like a log and roll on over to where, you, wherever your, your phone or your cell phone or wherever you can get help. Can you do it that way? And then try and pull yourself up. It's harder if you have bad knees, but you do the best you can. Um, if you are injured, and that's where you need to be able to to get yourself comfortable, but you need to be able to call for help, cell phone, uh, pull the phone down off the, the landline down or an alert system, and then try and protect yourself. Yeah, if you can grab a blanket to keep yourself warm, people go into shock when they're hurt. So if you are able to contact someone until they can get there, can you get a warm blanket over you? Can you make yourself comfortable so that you don't, you know, is there a pillow to put under your head so you're you're not struggling until they get there. 
but hopefully, I'm, I'm hoping you have some way to, to contact somebody. Um, and I think if you, if you witness somebody falling, the best thing you can do is just help them step by step to get to that point. Do not move somebody if they are physically hurt, make them comfortable and get them help. Do not try and get someone up right away if they've fallen. You don't know if they've broken something. Um, they'll say, oh yeah, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine, as they try and get up and it's like, oh, that hurts. Make sure they're fine, they're fine before you try and help them get up and, and then call for help. Um, so you, we want to end, now maybe we can go back to my video. We don't have time. Okay, so before I end up, um, one of the things I wanted to talk about, I had a little video in there about dancing. It's a, a 95 year old woman, I think, who gets out on the dance floor and dances like you wouldn't believe. So dancing is a wonderful form of balance exercise, of weight shifting. Think about standing in front of that kitchen counter and shifting your weight from one foot to the other. Turn the music on and just sway to the music. You're dancing. If you have a partner and you want to do a little box step, great. If you don't, don't worry about it. Just sway the music, you're dancing. So if you have the ability to get out there and, and try an exercise or two with a, with a dance instructor or a dance class, it's a wonderful form of balance exercise. Okay, so in the end, let's look at your tower. Tower blocks your risk factors. We wanna minimize how many? If you've decided not to change anything, um, how long can you balance all those risks? before, long before it starts to topple, okay? It's not just one thing, not just one thing that you, that you may change. You understand that falling is a combination of the different risk factors. So if you have all these issues toppling on top of each other, it increases your risk of falling. So making minor changes along the way can lower those risks. It's for your benefit and the benefit of your families. It's not it's not just about you. When I talk to my mom, she's like, oh, she won't do it for herself, but she'll do it for us because she knows she doesn't want to be a burden on her family. So um, as you age, we want you to age with dignity and maximize your health and maximize your function. Otherwise, the consequences of not doing that are, are monumental. So thank you for joining us today. Um, I guess we can try and open up for questions are we is there a website is there a website no there is not um let me see how we can try and think about that you want to send us your email and we can try and send set something up but um yeah let me think about that go ahead open yourself up Marsh. i'll mute myself um, no, it's fine. We can all, all talk. So, um, hi. Um, as far as exercises are concerned, yes, I mean, we can send you the Yale prevention exercises, but I would highly recommend because everybody is different. Everybody's functional level is different. So I would recommend that if you can go to your primary care and get a prescription for physical therapy, get a referral, get an evaluation. You don't need PT doesn't mean everybody needs to come here two times a week for eight weeks, no. But if you get an evaluation with one of the PTs, we can actually customize the exercises based on what your needs would be. And then you can do that at home for a month and then you can come again, ask us questions, see if we wanna improve them or see what's going on. But I would highly recommend that get a program for yourself so that you can get a customized exercise program for your own self based on your own needs rather than doing any general fall um, prevention exercises. So any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you for joining us. Feel free to come see Marcia and I in, in therapy. With a doctor's order, um, we're here to help you if you need help. And if you have any questions, you can probably, I don't know if they have our email addresses, please feel free to email us too with any, any questions you have in the future. All right, okay. thank you. Take care.